I'd like to get on to talk about genetic mapping. Uh, genetic mapping analysis has some objectives. The first objective is to detect quantitative trait loci. This acronym QTL it's the first time you've seen it, perhaps. Um, I was very careful not to use it prior to this in the talk. It uh, stands for quantitative trait locus. And what a quantitative trait locus is, is a location in the genome. It's not a gene. It's actually often quite a large region that may contain many genes. But it's a region of the genome that has a statistical association with a phenotype, a quantitative phenotype, and hence quantitative trait locus. Um, so we want to detect them. We want to know when they occur. But we also want to know what region of the genome they encompass. Because we want to identify the underlying gene, we need some kind of interval that defines the region of the genome that we're going to look in for that gene. And over the course of the semester, you'll learn a lot of techniques for how we look under the QTL, how we drill down and ask questions about what is in that location, that quarter of chromosome one, where we think something interesting is happening. You know, what could it be? How do we unravel that? We also, and probably least important, but um, nonetheless, we want to estimate the effect of the QTL on the phenotype, whether it's uh, whether the parent A allele would increase the blood pressure or decrease the blood pressure uh, might be a very useful thing to know. So <clears throat> this one's a lot. Um, QTL analysis is a is a beautiful statistical problem. Uh, it's it really captured me as a young statistician thinking about statistical problems. I really enjoyed the structure of this genetic problem. So we have these QTLs that I told you about, but we don't see them directly. We don't know where they are. We don't. We want to find them. That's our objective. What we can see, however, are markers, which are locations in the genome that have genotype data and phenotypes. And I'll also mention that we may see covariates. These may be things like sex or batch or mostly think sex um, that could affect the phenotype in addition to the QTLs. So my diagram here shows the QTL affecting the phenotype with a directed arrow. We're going to talk about these later, but I'm implying that the gene causes the phenotype. I bet you can all buy that. Um, it hasn't always been obvious that it works that way, but the gene affects the phenotype and not the other way around. The fact that you have high blood pressure does not change your DNA. But the fact that there's a difference in your DNA could affect your blood pressure. So there's a directed causal relationship. The QTL and the markers are going to be physically linked because they're on the same chromosome and somewhere in the genome there's going to be a marker that's near the QTL and that's pretty important. And because of this linkage, when we look at the marker, it may appear to be associated with the phenotype. Even though the marker itself, which is just some anonymous location in the, in the DNA, isn't actually the cause of the phenotype, it, because it's physically linked to the QTL, we see this spurious association. The marker can be statistically associated with the phenotype, and that's the key to mapping. I'll talk in, in a minute about the linkage part of the model, which is the QTL marker part of the model, and I'll talk a lot about the phenotype model, which is how we relate the phenotype to the QTLs and the covariates. This notation just says uh, there's some probability of the QTL genotype, given that I know the markers, and this one says that there's some probability distribution of the phenotype given that I know the QTL genotype and the covariates. So we're going to break the problem up into these two pieces. It rather neatly separates. So I'm going to try to describe this in the context of a specific example of a study. This is a blood pressure study where we did a back cross, and the back cross had a B strain, which was crossed to an F1 from a B by A cross. I'd like to point out that the paternal grandmother is B. In a mouse cross, we always write the female on the left. So the female parent of the cross is B. The male parent is an F1. And the parents of that F1 were B by A, 
B being the mother, hence the paternal grandmother, B. 250 male mice, uh, we fed them a high salt diet just to drive uh, the blood pressure a little harder. This is a, a reference to the study, the authors, the year it was published, the title, uh, the journal, you'll see these again. In case you're wondering how you take the blood pressure of a mouse, here's a picture. Uh, these hands, I should say, these hands are Hiro Sugiyama. It takes a special touch and a special person to measure the blood pressure of a mouse. Mice like to be in nice dark enclosures where they can peek out. So the, there's a special enclosure that goes on top of the mouse. It has a uh, little hole for his nose to peek out. And here the tail is um, enclosed in a blood pressure cuff, just like the thing that would go over your arm if you were in the doctor's office. This has a literally a clown balloon inside it that inflates and deflates about a hundred times over the course of a minute, and we get a, a blood pressure um, measurement. You can bet that this is a pretty noisy technique. Um, at the time it was state-of-the-art, it's still pretty good, um, but it is noisy, but it gives us a quantitative measure of blood pressure. Having measured the blood pressure of uh, 250 animals um, from my A by B cross, the, the ranges of the A and B parents are shown up above, and they're not that tight, but there they are. The, uh, the blood pressures of the 250 back cross animals can be shown as a histogram, and they range from about 85 to about 130 millimeters of mercury. Pretty pretty consistent with human. If you look at the heart rates, that might be different, but the blood pressure is comparable to a human blood pressure. There's a range, we know it's genetic, and uh, there's not really much else you can say now, is there? There's a range of blood pressures, okay. But if you look at that histogram for a moment, and I'm going to say that it's just an artifact of the way that the histogram was binned, but you can al almost imagine that there are two peaks it's almost like there's a low group and a high group. And if we, uh, if we take our imagination that, that extra step and, and, and draw this cartoon, imagine the blue curve is our blood pressure histogram that we can see. But underneath it, there are two histograms, and we can't see them, and they overlap a lot, which means any one mouse, we really can't tell whether it belongs to the low group or the high group. If it's way at one tail or the other tail, we might be able to make a good guess, but especially the mice in the middle, it's really hard to tell. Are they low blood pressure mice or are they high blood pressure mice? We don't know, but suppose there is a single locus in the genome, and I'm gonna call it Q for QTL, that has two alleles. I call them here zero and one. Uh, that's a quantitative representation of heterozygous and homozygous. And if you have a QTL allele of zero, your blood pressure is from some bell-shaped distribution that's shown here, pardon me, here. And if you have a QTL uh, allele of one, then your blood pressure comes from this other distribution, which has the same bell shape, but it's shifted over by delta. Mm -hmm. So delta is the effect of having the uh, one allele on your blood pressure. Increases blood pressure by one unit, or pardon me, one step of delta. So that's a cartoon. It's still not helping me, but I do have something that's going to help me, and that is the markers. So imagine that somewhere in the genome, there's a marker that's near the QTL. And you saw that I have covered my whole genome with markers. So somewhere, one of these markers is going to be near this locus that affects blood pressure. And if I find that marker, I'm going to say that it has a recombination, it, it has a recombination distance or a centimorgan distance of R away from the QTL, which means most of the time when the marker is zero, the QTL is zero, but every once in a while, R is a frequency, every once in a while they're recombined so that when the marker is zero, the QTL is really one, or when the marker is one, the QTL is really zero. So the marker is not a perfect measure of the QTL, but it should be pretty close. And I've drawn that in this 
part of the diagram by showing you that if the marker is zero, and uh, actually I meant to invert these pictures, so you might mentally invert them, but if the marker type is zero, you're more likely to belong to one class, and if the marker type is one, you're more likely to belong to the other QTL class. Now, you can actually do the algebra, really isn't that hard, and you can calculate the difference in the means between these two marker distributions should be one minus two R times delta. Delta is the effect size of the QTL, and 1 minus 2R is a function of the recombination distance between the marker and the QTL. When a marker and a QTL are on different chromosomes, they tend to segregate at random, so the chances that they co-segregate are a half. And I just like to point out that 1 minus 2 times a half is 0. So if the marker and the QTL are on different chromosomes, there would be no shift. If they're far apart in the genome, there'll be no or very little shift. Uh, so we're getting a measure, a kind of an attenuated measure of the QTL effect by looking at the marker. Think of dividing all the animals into two piles. There's the animals that have marker genotype zero and the animals that have marker genotype one and measuring uh, or comparing the blood pressures between these two groups. Uh, the, the way you statistically compare two groups of quantitative measures is you do something called a t-test. And I, I hope you're familiar with t-tests or you're ready to, uh, to do some quick review. Um, but I'm going to show you an example here where I've taken a marker on chromosome 1. I'm going to divide the animals at this marker into those animals that have a BB genotype and those that have an AB genotype. And on the y-axis, I'm showing you the, the phenotype. It's clearly not blood pressure, but this is a cartoon. Um, so the mean phenotype for the BB animals is about 68. The mean phenotype for the AB animals is about 52. And even though there's a lot of overlap between these two classes, they are statistically different. Well, there's a statistically significant difference between the two groups that we can evaluate with the test, the t-test. If we hop over to another chromosome, chromosome 2, and we do the t-test, the overlap between the two distributions is really wide. There's very little difference in their means, so they're not statistically different. I would conclude that there is a QTL somewhere near this marker on chromosome 1, and there's no QTL on chromosome 2, at least not near that marker. If I were to even speculate a little boldly, I might think that these animals in the BB group that have low phenotypes, and maybe this animal in the AB group that has a high phenotype, these might be animals where there was a recombination between the QTL and the marker. So at the marker, I know their genotypes, but at the QTL, the marker is not a perfect representation, so there can be some misclassification here. Mm -hmm. That's a bit of a subtlety. The point is that I could go through all my markers one at a time, I could look at each of them, and I could do a t-test, and I could find those markers that are linked to the QTL this way.